All right. So this week's guest is Karthik uh, Ramasamy, an old friend who's now head of streaming at Databricks. Welcome to the Data Exchange podcast. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you about uh, the new developments in the technologies and especially streaming. That's particular to my heart. And uh, full disclosure to our audience, as many of you know, I have been an advisor to Databricks from the beginning, but uh, we'll try our best to uh, really give you some uh, good content and some unbiased uh, perspectives in this uh, podcast. But uh, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, Kartik, but I, I was actually at the first meetup where Spark Streaming was announced at Yelp in San Francisco, must have been over eight years ago. And uh, I can tell you, even back then, uh, there were like uh, so many people in the audience were like blown away by, wait, so now I can use the same system for uh, batch and streaming? It was, it, and uh, when they gave the talk, it was still uh, not quite available yet. But people were like, when, when is this going to come out? When is this going to? So it just shows you uh, how far we've come along, right? So, because I, I was reading your announcement post of Lightspeed and the statistics for uh, usage of Spark Streaming are just insane, right? Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree. We have come a long way in streaming uh, uh, from the announcement on 2014, I believe 2014 or 2015, the first uh, Spark Streaming was announced. But at the same time, uh, other streaming engines were in play. At the time, I was part of uh, a developing a news uh, a streaming engine called uh, Heron at Twitter at that point for our internal purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Twitter, Twitter actually was instrumental in uh, making this whole area popular, uh, for example, with Storm, right? So Twitter, yep. was, Twitter was like uh, in many... Uh, for for people who don't remember, Twitter was like uh, the place for streaming. Yeah, that was uh, uh, what he called the alpha motor of streaming because the Twitter's data was naturally streaming, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. All all of the streaming examples were Twitter data. Yeah, uh, what he called uh, anomaly detections and uh, uh, what he called abuse and other aspects of uh, Twitter feeds were uh, using streaming. I mean, a lot of external examples that I meant. Um, there are even uh, some examples to, to introduce streaming uh, on what are the benefits of streaming and other aspects, right? So it was an exciting journey, uh, having been at Twitter for a few years, uh, developed streaming engine, then went on to develop uh, Pulsar, which is another uh, messaging slash uh, streaming solution. Then now back to Spock streaming. And of course, Spock streaming uh, Spark structured streaming growth has been incredible in the last uh, few years. We have been uh, experiencing around 150% uh, um, year after year growth. And uh, as of uh, uh, the submit, uh, when we revealed the data, we were running around 4 million streaming jobs. And, and uh, streaming jobs. Kartik, what's interesting in your post uh, is that uh, I think you guys hinted that many people who get into streaming actually start out with batch and then they realize, hey, we can use the same engine to handle streaming. And so that's how they kind of, uh, in many ways, they kind of graduate into streaming, many, many of the people who uh, use streaming, right? Yeah, so the key, the key thing is in order to accomplish that fact is the unification of the APIs. Right. So with the unification of the API and the turning a configuration from uh, one trigger type of trigger to another type of trigger helps you seamlessly uh, use the same job for batch as well as streaming, right? So that is the key to adoption of streaming because uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I've experienced so far in the decade of my encounter with streaming is uh, streaming is more of a technology and if people understand streaming as a use case, uh, then they realize the benefits of streaming, then they employ it in other uh, use cases, right? So, so in, uh, initial understanding of the streaming is always taught through some use cases. Um, so, so we're going to talk about the next generation of Spark streaming, which you folks call Project Lightspeed. But mm -hmm. just to to set some baseline, 
So what we're going to talk about uh, is stream processing, not storage. Mm -hmm. right? um, and uh, what else? What what? Uh, so what are kind of some of the parameters of our discussion? So I guess streaming in this case, we mean the data is continuously arriving and not kind of a batch, not not a batch job. Um, so other than that, right? So so we're processing data that's continuously arriving, broadly speaking, is what we're going to talk about in the context of Spark and the next generation of Spark streaming. Now, Spark streaming, before this interview, I looked up some stats. Uh, and actually, it's actually the most popular stream processing framework, as best I can tell. So at least in the... In the Silicon Valley, people mention another system called Flink, but as best I can tell through a variety of metrics. So one metric I use quite a bit is, for example, job posting. So smart mm -hmm. streaming is uh, uh, a lot a lot larger than many of these other stream processing systems. So that's kind of a baseline. All right. So mm -hmm. Project Lightspeed, yes. Project Lightspeed in the blog post. You you and your co-authors co called out a few things. So the first one, first goal is to improve latency and ensure latency is predictable. So first, let's briefly talk about the before and what will be the after. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point because the light speed emphasizes the four pillars and one of the pillars is um, reducing the latency of spark. Um, one of the misconceptions in, uh, in the market or in the field is uh, uh, Spark uh, latency is slow. Uh, so when we clock the, um, uh, the latency on a, what we call as an operational pipeline, so going the pipeline is taking data from a, a message bus or uh, writing the uh, reading uh, data from a message bus, uh, crunching data and uh, pushing that uh, results into a manual message bus. These are all what we call as operational pipelines, right? And um, when you measure this uh, very with a very simple processing where we just move data from one message bus to another message bus, we timed it around uh, uh, 440 milliseconds. So which means like uh, we uh, just take the data, route it to another topic in the, another message bus, that's all. So then we uh, did some benchmarking why it is taking 440 milliseconds or whatever it is. And we broke down a bunch of uh, aspects uh, using some benchmark and uh, uh, profiling and other aspects. There were a bunch of low hanging fruits uh, which were there, uh, which we can um, eliminate or make it more sophisticated that will give us a lot of um, performance. And uh, some of the aspects include what we call as uh, faster bookkeeping. So currently like, uh, uh, but, uh, so, 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 Kartik, uh, so just to push back a little bit, so there are stream processing frameworks mm -hmm. that are more na native stream processing, right? So, so maybe they do have lower latency. So, the question has always been how low latency do you really need to achieve your use case, right? Yes, and so in you, what. And since Databricks has so many customers, right? So in your mind, uh, is there a misconception there about how low latency, I mean, outside of high frequency trading? Yes. Well, how low latency is, uh, do most use cases really need? I think like so far the lowest latency that I have heard from our customer pool is around uh, uh, 250 to 300 milliseconds. That's and what I have heard. And Spark Streaming can handle what? Can handle uh, stateless pipelines around that time, around that uh, speed. So currently we are around 440 milliseconds. So with the new improvement that we are going to do, the engine itself will go down to 30 to 40 milliseconds. With the message bus overhead, we can get it to like 120 milliseconds. And so then how many, so our customers or Forget about Databricks customers, but uh, in your mind, even in your Heron days, mm -hmm. how many people are in the 30, 100 millisecond setting? Yeah, I think like uh, there are very few because if you look at all the use cases and the time budget that we have seen, uh, if we achieve like uh, 30 to 100 millisecond, we should capture most of the 98% of the use case. Right. right. By the way, uh, 
uh, Kartik, when you when we talk about streaming engines, so we focus about data processing, right? So stream mm -hmm. processing. So do you are any of these engines also relevant for kind of machine learning inference, serving up predictions and no. So they're mostly just for moving data from one place to another and processing the data, right? Yeah, there are multiple applications of streaming. I mean, moving is one aspect of the streaming, right? And then the second aspect is ingestion, ingestion into some kind of analytical database uh, like Lake House. That is another pattern that we have seen. So the third pattern is uh, capturing the data from CDC and loading into Delta warehouse uh, or a data warehouse. That is a third pattern. And the fourth pattern is operational pipelines, where I data goes from one message bus, crunches it, and go to another message bus. And usually in operational pipelines, uh, some kind of action is associated with it, which is more machine-based uh, associations. So those are the um, patterns. But, that it, you've but seen. it's a, a, a very a different system altogether as actually serving up the predictions, right? So those are model servers and. There are uh, what you call specialized systems to do ML model, but that doesn't mean uh, preclude the fact that uh, streaming engines can be used for ML inferences as well. So if the it's a question of how do you design your ML inference, or so you or, or, or uh, you need the, if if something is coming in, you need to kind mm -hmm. of process the data anyway and then send mm -hmm. it, to, right? Yes. So for example, in an ML inference, uh, you could have two streams. One is a data stream, another is the model stream. And uh, when the model gets updated periodically, uh, that uh, uh, is the model is sent out as a stream, but that depends on the size of the model, how the model is chunked. So a bunch of uh, things do you need to be observed. Um, on the high velocity stream where the data is coming in, uh, the model will be stored in an operator, which is in memory of uh, multiple partitions of a streaming engine or a streaming execution, then look up into a model and update your serving database, which is a, a Dynamo DB or right, uh, right, right, right. Uh, Cassandra or whatever might be the case, right? So, so in the on the latency front, uh, there are two goals. One is to lower the latency, which we've right. established. Uh, you guys are uh, uh, going to be able to do right. So, and then yes. the second goal is to make latency more predictable. So, tell us the situation today and what exactly are you guys? trying to do there yeah so like uh, one of the things again uh, uh, there are some uh, bookkeepings which happens at the front of uh, start of the micro batch and the end of the micro batch and there are multiple bookkeeping uh, happens even at the front uh, start of the micro batch and the end of the micro batch right by smoothening these uh, uh, bookkeeping uh, rather than writing at every micro batch we are trying to write it at every end batch so that way, what happens is the latency gets smoother and smoother. The variability in um, uh, latency goes uh, much smoother. Uh, we have some graphs uh, that we will share in the uh, upcoming blogs. So we can see the variation is uh, 10 milliseconds as, uh, as compared to 120 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds from a latency perspective. And the reason why we found out this uh, Anything that you touch within the cloud storage, the cloud storage is a shared cloud storage, dedicated bandwidth and everything sometimes is hard to get, right? By removing the storage uh, on the critical path and making that asynchronous along with the micro batch execution, um, we can make the latency much smoother. So by the way, Kartik, just to, again, to uh, mm -hmm. establish some sort of baseline. So everything we're gonna discuss, everything you've talked so far about and probably everything we're going to talk about is Spark streaming open source, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So these are all going to be the open source. Uh, once we um, fix uh, some of the uh, performance improvements and everything, uh, it will find its way to the open source. So on the latency front, uh, where are you today in terms of the engineering efforts and how long before everything you've mentioned uh, goes out to uh, open source Spark streaming? I think like we are targeting uh, Q3, Q4 of uh, this year. Uh, so uh, in fact, already some of the aspects like uh, asynchronous uh, checkpointing is already in uh, production and it has to find its way into open source. Uh, whereas uh, the bookkeeping and other aspects 
or in the process of being implemented and tested. And uh, once it is uh, rolled out into production, it will find its way into open source. So the idea of um, these fixes or these improvements uh, will be incrementally pushed out into open source. All right. So the second big goal is to mm. enhance functionality for data mm -hmm. processing with new op operators and APIs. So mm. Spark Streaming today, you can already use SQL, Python, Scala, Java, right? Mm -hmm. So so what do you mean by new operators and APIs? Okay. So, um, I mean, let me take down as a uh, own language at a time, right? So on the Python, we already have a rich set of operators, but uh, one of the key thing that is missing is in Python is a, a stateful uh, processing in Python with uh, programmer flexibility. In other words, the programmers have to be, or the users have to be capable of writing their own stateful operators, right? And uh, towards the end, uh, Scala and Java API has this uh, Flat, flat map group with state and map group with state, which allows the user to write explicit code uh, that can um, uh, get a key and a corresponding state, and you can manipulate the state and uh, store the state back. And Python, we don't have that capability yet. So because of that, uh, uh, some of the financial customers uh, who are interested in writing something like a exponential weighted average, they're not able to do those aspects, right? I have those aggregations. So this will help them uh, write their own Python code and execute them and manipulate the state and store the state back. And uh, so that is the one gap in Python that we are addressing. And uh, the challenge with that approach is, uh, remember we are uh, running on a JVM and users are writing Python code. How do you execute Python code in a JVM, right? So we have to go out of band, execute it and get it back the results. And how to, uh, what are its performance implications uh, how to initialize these workers and uh, and terminate these workers when the job is done. So there are a lot of tricky issues that we are plowing through. But uh, the key is uh, to support these stateful operators in a performant way. So the exponential moving average example is uh, interesting because it seems quite basic that you, mm -hmm. you you need to be able to do that, right? So especially in finance. But anyway, so uh, if you don't mind, so what is the rough breakdown of Spark streaming usage by language? Is Python num by far number one? I believe so. I don't have the exact numbers in my yeah. top of my head, but uh, Python is one of the largest users of uh, Spark structured streaming. And uh, the reason why uh, Python is very popular is because it's easy to write. And right. A lot of Python programmers uh, wants to do some incremental processing um, and they use that incremental processing to do some backfill data and other aspects which are part of the streaming. Uh, so that way Python is the number one, uh, followed by Java, followed by uh, uh, Scala. I think like between Python and uh, Java, I think uh, SQL is the next popular one. Uh, I think for SQL offering, we are providing something called DLT, right? Uh, which is actually has the capability to write it in SQL and uh, deploy it in, uh, in Databricks. And that means like uh, all the VMs and uh, other processing aspects of the, all the operations aspect of it, this thing is taken care of, like auto scaling, or scaling up, scaling down, depending upon traffic. And if they, during the other time, the pipeline restarts automatically itself without even having to do. Essentially, TLT is geared towards kind of fire and forget. So you write your code and mm -hmm. fire it, and it will automatically detect all the cases of failure and everything. It will auto-correct itself. So it's, uh, my impression is uh, stream processing frameworks, uh, I guess uh, Spark Streaming was the first in, in this regard, added SQL, and mm -hmm. now uh, it's kind of like a must-have, right? So if you're a stream processing framework, you should have SQL. Yes, that is a must-have because SQL uh, gives a, what we call as a familiar flavor of streaming to a lot of analysts, data analysts. So data analysts are uh, know SQL very well, Python very well. So if you have this familiar interface of interacting uh, uh, with them, then uh, the usage of streaming grows, right? 
So, so SQL is a must, in fact, uh, for a uh, lot of the streaming engines in order to be successful. As Fox is kind of showing the way, structured streaming showing the way. In fact, the entire Spark structured streaming is based on SQL engine of the Spark itself. So, anything else to add on new operators and APIs? Yeah, there's a bunch of things that uh, we are working on. Uh, one of the uh, another aspect is uh, multiple stateful aggregate uh, operators. So, for example, um, if we do a join followed by aggregations, uh, there was uh, some. Uh, limitations in terms of the Spark uh, watermark, uh, how the two stateful operators can be worked in tandem, right? One after the other rather. So we are uh, kind of adding that capability so that you can have uh, uh, join followed by aggregations and chain aggregation and other aspects. Uh, so that is- So Kartik, in general, when you do a join like that, uh, one table is, one table is like streaming, but the other one is fixed, right? So it's like a dimension. No, it, could be, it can be it can be either one of them. What we call as a, what you are alluding to is called a stable stream join. Yeah. Um, so there is another aspect of a join called a stream stream join, where the two streams are flowing through. You have to join as well, right? Wow. That, that's so, a difficult. That's a difficult. Difficult. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the thing is, like we do support those kind of joins uh, yeah. now. The key is after the join, you want to do some aggregations, right? How to do that in a single query, right? So those kind of aspects. And there's sometimes like a, a chained aggregation where you do 10 minute aggregation and using 10 minutes aggregation, you want to do one hour aggregation, right? So those kind of aspects, which is our two chained operators, right? So those- uh, So what is, uh, uh, so Kartik, so uh, now we're talking a lot about SQL in the context of uh, streaming or real-time data. But on the mm. other hand, uh, as you know, there are these other systems, uh, time series databases. So yeah. what's the relationship between a stream processing engine and one of these time series databases that might also be do be capable of doing SQL? Okay, there, there are a lot of differences, actually. The first yeah. to do foremost difference is Time series databases always expect some notion of a time uh, in the record. That is one aspect. The second aspect is the time series data is stored as it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It has nothing, it has nothing to do with stream. It's as orthogonal to streaming. Right? Yeah, it's what I call as a store and query model. All right. So All right. you store it, and you slice it and dice it by time. Right. Okay. Right. 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 On the other hand, the stream processing engine uh, is uh, what you call process where the data is in motion, right? Right. So you which uh, which there are it. a lot which there are a lot of use cases for why why you might want to do that, right? Yep, there are a lot of plenty of use cases, and some of the use cases involve uh, uh, what do you call fault detection, anomaly detection, drift detection, model inference. Um, then uh, compliant uh, yeah yeah you compliant. don't you don't you don't have the luxury of waiting for all of your data to arrive and then yes. query it right so yeah so instead you uh, uh, the if any compliance uh, regulations uh, and other things are being violated you want to capture that uh, uh, when the data is immediately cap um, uh, produced right away right so rather than waiting the daily reports or monthly reports or weekly reports so that way like uh, you are insights get into more close to real time or rather real time so that you can prevent it before uh, damage happens. So so the third area of efforts is around improving the support for connectors. So yes. uh, connectors in this sense, I guess, both uh, sources and sinks. Yes. So Spark Streaming is not a new system. Yes, so, yes. But then on the other hand, uh, as many of our listeners know, the uh, data ecosystem continues to add many, many new systems. So it's uh, uh, it's impossible to actually keep up with all of these new systems, right? So, so what are your priorities in terms of connectors to new sources and sync? If, you if you're comfortable, you can name exactly what you guys are trying to connect to. Yeah. 
I think the as you said that the ecosystem is constantly adding new systems <laughs> into the whole mix. And uh, in addition to the fact that with the cloud being a major force, the cloud uh, service providers are also adding new systems uh, that are uh, people wanted to capture the data from, right? So from that aspect, uh, we already support uh, um, a lot of connectors in the open source. Uh, in the uh, Databricks aspect, uh, we also support uh, Kafka, Kinesis, um, as a first-class citizen, and even Hub uh, for Microsoft also support as a first-class citizen. You, you didn't uh, mention Pulsar. Uh, <laughs> Pulsar is coming. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. So, yeah. I mean, as it, we are a, a company that, uh, uh, based on customer demand, we keep adding more and more stuff, connectors, and especially... As a, so so let, let, let's focus on Spark open source. Mm -hmm. So what what are the connectors that you guys are working on in this uh, Project Lightspeed? Okay, so the Project Lightspeed, we are uh, doing uh, two, three major things. One is adding a, a DynamoDB connector, because especially for operational pipelines, who are updating the key value store in the cloud, so the, the thing might be needed. Um, second one is uh, for operational pipelines, uh, people want to write it back into Kinesis and uh, send uh, from Kinesis alerts and everything, right? So for that, uh, we are looking at Amazon Kinesis thing. Then uh, from uh, Amazon Kinesis source perspective, uh, Amazon has launched a feature called EFO, Enhanced Fan Out Support, which allows you to, the consumer of Kinesis can have exclusively, each consumer can have exclusively two megabyte bandwidth, right? Okay. And rather, rather than the original version of the Kinesis where two megabyte uh, is shared across all the consumers, right? So here each consumer gets two megabytes per second, right? So this is one of the popular asks among customers. We are going to incorporate that. Um, then uh, the another biggest uh, push is coming from the customers is uh, Google pops up. Okay. So, so it, it, it's a streaming system. It has its own set of APIs. Uh, that is a uh, major major effort going on to improve the Google Pops Up connector, or rather, write a new Pops Up connector, so that will support uh, Google Pops Up as a first class citizen in uh, Spark streaming, structured streaming, right? And uh, so that is going on. So these are the connectors and ecosystem. And in addition to that, uh, actual connectors and uh, sources and things, we need to support a slew of features like authentication, authorization. Uh, right, uh, right, right, right. So each one has a own way of uh, very, very uh, important enterprise features. Yeah. So, so on the, from that angle, the IAM support for uh, MKS, then uh, uh, then other authentication aspects and pops up based on Google GCP. So, so a lot of uh, these features are getting into these connectors as well, so that when people launch the pipeline. Uh, the pipelines will work seamlessly, assuming that they, they have the right authentication authorization, right? So, so it's it seems like a, a lot of what you mentioned are sources, hmm. not too much on the sync side. Is that because uh, on the sync side it's kind of easier? I mean, uh, the the way you the way you uh, send data to a system is kind of more much more standard. I think there are two aspects to that. One is, remember I was mentioning about the analytical patterns versus operational patterns, right? So the predominant workload is analytical patterns where they capture the data, do some ETL on the data, and put the data into Delta or a data, data, layer, data lake, right? So, or the lake house. So from that aspect, like uh, uh, the sink is uh, the Delta lake, and we have already authorization, authentication, other aspects into the Dell uh, uh, Lake House, right? So um, for those kind of patterns, it's pretty seamless. Now the things uh, are mainly required. What about um, Kartik, this class of systems that you and I have talked about in the past, I don't know what to call them. I guess mm -hmm. one one class of them will be the time series databases, mm -hmm. but then there's uh, RocksDB, ClickHouse, Druid. I don't know what you call these systems. Right, so, so there are a group of systems called uh, real-time analytics, uh, analytics. So which means like uh, uh, there are there is Pino, then Rockset, then uh, Clickhouse, and um, but people Druid. already uh, th people who use those systems already use Spark Streaming, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So if they do use path streaming, I think like uh, open source has several of those connectors, even um, so already. So if there is any uh, explicit customer request that is coming along, we will on a, we'll, uh, try to address that gap as uh, if there is any gaps that is uh, needed into those systems, right? Um, but uh, from a Databricks perspective, uh, uh, most of the workloads is mostly analytical pattern. With the reduction in latency, with the quick reaction in time, uh, we are going to enable the operational pipelines as well. So when you enable the operational pipelines, as we connect, uh, then we might, uh, there might be a desire to connect or it might be a need to connect more and more systems, right? Like those you mentioned. So those connectors will we'll take it up as demand comes through. So the fourth area of focus is simplifying deployment of mm -hmm. monitoring and troubleshooting. Now, Spark streaming, uh, one of the reasons it's successful, has been successful in the past, is it's because uh, it's uh, relatively easy to operate, right? So I'm I'm assuming uh, uh, you guys have areas that you're going to focus on on this aspect. So can you share what uh, what specific things you are working on to make it even simpler? Yeah. I think like uh, one of the things that uh, I learned it from Heron is uh, to make it as easy and even automate the operation as much as possible, right? Um, based on some of the experiences in the past. Uh, so so the current um, way of uh, executing the Spark uh, structure gaming uh, micro batches, uh, you get a lot of data and metrics for every micro batch. Using that, you can hone in a particular micro batch execution and its corresponding um, latency and everything, right? But what you need is uh, some kind of a data flow view of the entire graph. And once you have that entire- So, so like, a da like a dashboard? No, the DAG, how the job oh, looks like, yeah. okay? Right, right, that right. At any stage of the job, I want to give a timeline view in the sense like uh, uh, this my microbatch at time T1 uh, uh, experience this latency, uh, time T2 experience this latency and uh, so on and so forth, right? So that uh, you can uh, have a continuous view of uh, how the microbatch is executing and crunching data and how the latency is increasing or decreasing or constant or the throughput is uh, increasing, decreasing. And uh, so, so uh, yeah, so that's why I was asking. So are you going to provide like a dashboard to do this? To yes, do this? provide a dashboard and a timeline view of the dashboards yeah. so that... Uh, uh, we can know what's happening. In fact, we're, when it, we do it, in the it, past, it, it, it sounds like similar to the dashboard of the orchestration systems. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, like uh, uh, I used to in the past life uh, when we were developing streaming system, each job used to do hundred plus hundred to two hundred metrics for uh, troubleshooting purposes. Right? We want to bring that level of visibility so that. Uh, Anybody who's operating Spark streaming job have the visibility into what's really going on, right? And also, like uh, then this is as... what you're talking about here is open source. Yes. Okay. The second aspect is uh, how to collect these logs and uh, make sure those uh, logs highlight uh, what we call uh, the problem or trouble spots and troublesome areas, right? So that uh, because streaming jobs are always running, and some of the uh, jobs uh, might be highly critical in the business uh, nature, right? So you might want to fix it and get it up. No, no. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, as as many listeners know, when I th when I think of ops, I mm -hmm. think of three things, right? So uh, monitoring, mm -hmm. um, kind of a root cause analysis, yes, alerts, mm -hmm. and and basically the goal is to help. You assume that things will fail. The goal is to reduce your mean time to recovery. Yep. So that that's the goal of ops, right? So that's the goal of ops. In fact, I even I was I wanted to uh, we wanted to take it to the next level where automate the operations when uh, you program a set of rules. Even the CPU is like great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Auto automation. Uh, yeah, that's another key yes. aspect of ops, right? So automation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we wanted to get to the next level of automation as well. And so, uh, what is the timeline for for uh, this uh, ops aspect of uh, Project Lightspeed? 
So the ops aspect is uh, uh, probably we are targeting sometime next year, but uh, the current f- focus is uh, on pillar one, the latency aspect, the second aspect, the improving functionality, and the third aspect, connectors. Uh, so we are not uh, staffed the uh, debugability and observability yet, but uh, soon it's going to be uh, staffed and uh, uh, some stream of work will be uh, it, it taken up by the engineers. But uh, so once we, I have some visibility, I can share some timeline with you, but we are targeting sometime middle of to end of next year. So, so Project Lightspeed, it sounds like it's uh, it's got these four pillars. Mm-hmm. But each pillar can roll out at different times, right? Yes. So as a Spark streaming user, what should people expect? So it'll be like a... Each uh, major update of Spark Streaming might actually check out, check off one of these pillars of Project Lightspeed. Yeah, no, you don't have to wait for a new major version. As the, uh, the features are available incrementally, uh, we will roll it out. We are not going to wait everything to be ready before we launch it. Instead, we wanted to incrementally roll it out, and it could be part of the major version of this uh, Spark Streaming, or it could be uh, even in the minor version because it's not something. Uh, uh, incompatible or whatever it is. It's just a feature or a performance improvement, right? It might even roll out in the minor version, right? So that way, like, uh, the target is to roll out as quickly as possible, but uh, uh, we want to make sure that we do a, a good job on testing and a good uh, quality so that people, when they use it, they're happy. So so you, as you mentioned at the start of this podcast, you've been involved in many other... Uh open source communities, right? So mm-hmm. notably Heron and Pulsar. So mm-hmm. talk to us about the Spark streaming community. Uh, how big is it? Uh, and uh, uh, how can people contribute or or who are the contributors? Is it mostly Databricks? So how would you assess the, the Spark streaming uh, ecosystem? I think uh, Spark Streaming is the most uh, downloaded uh, streaming engine so far that I've seen from the Maven Central. Um, there are some of the statistics that we have seen. Uh, there is a several, uh, I don't know the number on top of my head, but it's one of the most uh, downloaded uh, engines in the world. And uh, there are committers coming from different companies uh, who have contributed to Spark Streaming. And uh, uh, now we, uh, uh, with the, uh, New addition of a lot of uh, new group with Databricks. You can expect a lot of uh, contributions from Databricks also coming together there because streaming has been growing organically without any effort uh, within uh, Databricks itself. Now that is changing, and uh, we are investing a lot heavily in uh, structured streaming, and uh, it's uh, structured streaming is uh, here to stay, uh, and um, there's a group behind it. Uh, then um, we are going to constantly improve it from uh, various different angles, whatever the new features that are coming in from uh, customer requirements, as well as uh, uh, anything that comes out of research, we will be rolling it out as soon as we can. But uh, structure streaming is uh, launched into the next generation. That's why we initiate the project like speed. It is a multi-year effort, but we will persist through it. And uh, as we learn and more this thing, more and more features will be added. So in a previous life, you were also an academic researcher, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, talk to us about, so on the academic side of streaming, I don't know if you still follow it. Is there anything in, on on that side that uh, has caught your attention that uh, maybe will not appear in Spark Streaming right away, but uh, has is intriguing to you? Uh, not that much. I mean, there are a lot of academic research is happening, especially um, mostly on the off side of streaming engine because that's very challenging. Like, how do you auto scale? How do you scale down? Uh, then uh, aspects like uh, automated or uh, how to uh, deal with automated operations, right? Uh, so those are the ch- challenges that everybody faces in streaming, and the scale is another uh, aspect that uh, streaming engines always face. But Spark Stretching, thanks to the uh, way the Spark Structure the streaming is designed, um, it can scale quite heavily. In fact, uh, it should be a uh, study for uh, some of the streaming researchers how to scale it. Um, that's where the research is going on. 
but uh, another uh, area of uh, uh, in this thing that we could uh, potentially uh, we are working on is as i said is uh, latency improvement there are quite nice tricks that we can uh, follow which might be good for researcher as well because uh, there are uh, two school of thoughts in streaming engine one is pessimistic streaming engines another one is optimistic streaming engine pessimistic streaming engine assume that the systems are going to fail at any time right or more frequently so i checkpoint every operator right so which means uh, since they do every checkpoint every operator um it, it might uh, go a little bit uh, slower because of the checkpointing at every stage but thing is the recovery will be quicker right on the other hand so which means these kind of streaming engines are good in to run in the spot instances right which are cheaper right. and uh, if latency is not a big concern second aspect is optimistic streaming engines where they assume failures are very rare i will run as fast as we can but the thing is moment it fails i will take more time to recover right uh, so um, spot belongs to the pessimistic uh, uh, streaming system and uh, some of the other systems like continuous flow system like keren flink and all these things belong to the optimistic concurrency control in the op- optimistic uh, streaming systems right now uh, with the new approach that we have taken with the spark uh, uh, structured streaming you can adjust that degree you can make it completely pessimistic you can uh, completely make it optimistic as well so you can play it along this line by doing some configuration this is the new innovation that we are doing right so by allowing the faster bookkeeping happening at every batch you get the optimum pessimistic system by doing it at every end batches you get an optimistic system so so on the automation side it seems to me that this is an area where you can use machine learning right you could uh, now uh, be of the that is a completely unexplored area how yeah. to apply machine learning into streaming to make better operations that is a completely unexplored area we touched upon this topic a little bit uh, um, when i uh, was at twitter but one of the challenges uh, was the fact that uh, in order to, because operations means you need instant result machine learning takes some amount of data to build up before we make some uh, meaningful decisions right yeah yeah in the it the uh, will there's a cold start problem right yes yeah, so yeah. so that is why like uh, i think uh, my sense is probably a hybrid set of uh, model will work there so um, if a pipeline is running in production so initially the metrics the regular metrics will give the value uh, for debugging and troubleshooting for operations as the um, uh, production pipeline has been running for probably several weeks and months then um, the machine learning models can take over because the data collected is in right will help a lot in terms of continue to govern the operations of the pipeline so uh kartik in closing is streaming an area where uh, people have tried to build specialized hardware people have tried all kind of things in streaming right <laughs> so <laughs> definitely yes i think like i believe that some of the uh hft uh, high frequency trading folks are doing some streaming but it more at the hardware level like nanosecond level because every nanosecond is a million dollar advantage that you can think about right, right. so so definitely like uh, people have tried uh, those aspects but uh, so, what, what so is there are... like a uh, do you think there will be some sort of hardware that will allow you to do high performance streaming on one beefy server instead of a scale out scenario you know i think uh, uh that depends on what you do with the streaming right for example if a data is coming a lot network could be, become a bottleneck because network speed might not be enough to handle all the data into even the cpu and the hardware might be able to handle it right, right. so right. there are a lot of other aspects which might prevent uh, doing everything in a single node as compared to multi node system right or a distributed system so that is the challenge that you will face because data is always growing right Right, right, right. And with that, uh, thank you, Kartik. And I will link to some resources here uh, in the episode notes, particularly uh, uh, resources around how you can uh, uh, follow 
what Kartik and his team are doing around uh, uh, Project Lightspeed. Uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, content that they want to push out there, uh, not just uh, online, but also in uh, in meetups. So thank you, Kartik. Thanks, Ben. It was a uh, nice talking to you.